Okay, there we go. Hope that's not getting in anyone's way there. Should be good. Excellent. All right, so let's continue on where we uh, we left off here, which was dealing with second order differential equations. So last class, we did finish first order, um, which again, first order, we had a, a number of different techniques that we could use to solve when it's in really nice forms. So again, our first goal with try, trying to solve a first order is we have our dy by dx on one side. We try to move everything else on the other side. And then we try to remember all the tools we learned from Math 1004. So all our techniques of integration, the use substitution, integration by parts, partial fractions, trig substitution, all of that fun stuff. If we can apply any of those, awesome. Now, if we can't apply those, then we look at the specific forms. Can we break this down into something that looks like a separable function? Uh, if not, okay, let's move on to the next one. Is this linear? Does it meet a linear differential equation form force? And then if so, awesome, we find that integrating factor and move on. And if that's not the case, then we put it in differential form. So that's having two terms on my left-hand side, a zero on my right-hand side, um, and having a dx in one of the terms and a dy in the other terms. And when we test for exactness, what we're doing is verifying whether or not there exists a function f that is part of two variables, x and y, such that its differential is exactly what we, we have in this form. And then we have to reverse and try and solve for that. Um, and those are really it. Those are all our tools that we have. So now that we're picking up second order, and really second order and above, we have less tools that we can use in order to solve these. So we have to look at specific problems. So the first thing that we're looking at here, as we mentioned last class, is homogeneous problems. So homogeneous problems is when our function on that right-hand side is strictly zero. Because there is this nice property that, especially for second order, but this holds true for any degree order, if I can find two linearly independent functions, which are solutions, so if we can find And we'll say a y sub 1 and y sub 2, where both of these are linearly independent and they're solutions to our original differential equation, second order differential equation, then our general solution um, which are linearly independent, then our general solution is y is equal to some linear combination of these two. So some scalar c1 times y1 plus some scalar c2 y2. So if we have these two linearly independent solutions, awesome. Then the general solution again is just all possible combinations of these. So the way I try and relate this back is last class we were talking about linear, linear algebra. And if I was dealing specifically in R2, I want a way of being able to express every single point in R2. But I don't want to list every single point. I want to be able to express it as a linear combination of two vectors. So given any point in A or R2, so A and B, where A and B are any real numbers, I can write any vector here as just a linear combination of A times the vector 1, 0, plus B times the vector 0, 1. And this first vector here, second vector here, this formed a basis for our space. So if we have a basis, which again has to have the correct number of vectors, in this case we're dealing with R2, so we only need two vectors. If we were dealing with R3, we'd need three, R4, we would need four. But in this case, R2, so I need two vectors, and they have to be linearly independent. The same idea holds true as to what we're trying to do now. Since we're dealing with a second order, I just need to find two linearly independent solutions these would form the basis for all possible solutions, which is exactly what I have here. All possible solutions are just linear combinations of these two. So that's the trick. If I want to go to higher order, all the methods that we're doing here are going to work for higher order. That's kind of the nice thing. But in higher order, again, for degree three, I'm going to need three linearly independent solutions. Degree four, four linearly independent solutions. Degree n, n linearly independent solutions. And just from what we're going to see here, Trying to find one or two is a real big pain. 
So we're going to try and cheat our ways of being able to, to come up with these two solutions. So that's why we're looking at some very, very simple cases to begin with. But this is our goal. Our goal is to find this, specifically for right now. So again, same idea as before. We want to find some function y, which is going to be a solution. Here, what we're looking to do is, again, find that general solution. So linear combination of two linearly independent solutions. So as I said, the general solution for a second order differential equation, this is in standard form. Standard form just means that the coefficient in front of my y double prime is going to be a one. So then I have my p of x, q of x, and again, we are assuming that these are, con are uh, continuous functions. And of course, zero on the, the right-hand side. So that was typically our function f of x. Right now, we are assuming that is going to be zero. So what we're doing now is we're going to solve for the homogeneous, and then we're going to kind of work backwards and try and go, okay, well, if I have a solution to the homogeneous, how do I create a solution to my original problem where f of x may not be zero? So that's where we're heading towards. So we call two linearly independent solutions, that y1, y2, that basis that we are looking for, it's called the fundamental set of solutions on i. Now, it's called a fundamental set of solutions, not the fundamental set, because same as here, if I have two linearly independent vectors, those become my basis for all of R2. Same idea here. It doesn't have to be a specific y1 and y2. The condition is they just have to be linearly independent. So moreover, uh, if y1 and y2 are linearly independent solutions, then as I said, the general solution is just all possible linear combinations of this. So some C1, some C2. But when we write out this general solution, unless we're dealing with an initial value problem where we're looking for a particular solution, in that case, we'd be finding some C1 and C2 where this is going to work. But in general, we are going to always have it as some constant times our first function plus some constant times our, our second, where these some constant are just going to be arbitrary for the time being. So this outlines our, our strategy at this point in time for, sec for solving second order um, homogeneous differential equations. So the first step in this is obviously we want to find two linearly independent solutions. And I state that like this is going to be some easy thing for us to do. It's not always going to be the case. If we could find one, awesome. We'll start with the way of trying to find the second. Um, but again, that's also going to be a little bit of a pain. Then we're going to look at specific forms where we can actually easily predict what the, the possible solutions are going to be. Really, all of this has to be like, we're not solving any of these problems directly. It's all looking at what does this problem seem to, to represent? And is there something I can kind of chip my way into forcing this to be a solution? And then, of course, putting it into the general form. So for this exercise here, I have three parts. I'm going to first suppose that e to the x and e to the 2x are solutions to the following differential equation. So I'm dealing with y double prime minus 3y prime plus 2y is equal to 0. So assuming that these are true, first thing that we want to do is, well, let's not assume that they're true. Let's verify that these are, in fact, solutions. So if I wanted to verify that there were solutions, what would I do? Yeah, I'm going to plug them in. That's exactly what I'm going to do. If I said x plus y is equal to 7, and x is equal to 5, y is equal to 2 is a possible solution, what do we do? We plug them in. Does the left-hand side equal the right-hand side? Yes, it is a solution then. Same idea here. So I have one function, I'll call that y sub 1 is going to be e to the x, and my second one, y sub 2, is going to be e to the 2x. I'm not asking if they're linearly independent at this point. All I'm asking is simply, are they solutions? And if they are solutions, awesome. So let's start with that first part. Let's ask the question, are they in fact solutions? So this is exercise 3. So we're going to let y sub 1 equal e to the x, and y sub 2 is going to be equal e to x. So first thing I'm going to do, because I'm going to need to plug in y, I'm going to need to plug in y prime and y double prime, is I'm going to take the first and second derivatives of these two possible solutions. So if I start off with y1, and y1 is equal e to the x, y1 prime is equal to, derivative of e to the x is, 
There we go, e to the x. And y, 1, double prime is still e to the x. Okay, so now I take my left hand side. So my left hand side, this is equal to, um, I have y double prime minus 3y prime um, plus 2y. And all I'm going to do now is simply plug and play exactly what I have. So my y double prime, that's e to the x, so I'm substituting this in. Minus 3 y prime, y prime is e to the x, awesome, substitute that in. And last but not least, I have, oops, not equals. Uh, I have a plus 2y, so plus 2, and y is again just e to the x. So substituting that in. So I have e to the x minus 3 e to the x, that gives me negative e to the x, plus e to the x. Or sorry, see if I can do basic arithmetic here. e to the x minus 3 to the x gives me a minus 2 e to the x, plus 2 e to the x, this gives me 0, which just so happens to be my right hand side. So my left hand side is equal to my right hand side, it is in fact a solution. It's the same idea for my second one. So y2, this is equal to e2 to the x, y2 prime is e2 to the x, then I take the derivative of what's on the inside, so the derivative of 2 to the x is just going to be 2, and again, repeat the process, y2 double prime, we have e2 to the x, derivative of 2 to the x, again, it's 2, 2 times 2 gives me 4. So I have my y, y prime, y double prime, same idea, plug in my left hand side, see if it equals my right hand side. So left hand side is equal to, again, y double prime, which is 4 e to the 2x, minus 3, um, y prime, y prime is 2 e to the 2x, and last but not least, plus, um, plus 2, uh, y, so e2 to the x. So I have 4 e2 to the x, minus 3 times 2 gives me a minus 6 e2 to the x, plus 2 e to the x, this gives me a 0, which is equal to my right hand side. So again, left hand side equals to the right hand side, awesome. This is in fact a, no, they're both in fact solutions for us. So part B now asks for the general solution. So what is the, the general solution to this? Okay, it's kind of a trick question. What do I need to do before I can give the general solution? Yeah? Check if they're linearly independent. Perfect. They're both solutions, but not any two solutions will work. They have to be linearly independent. So if I look at my y2, my y1, if I have y2 over y1, so y2 is equal to, I get e to the 2x, I have e to the x, this is going to leave me with e to the x. This is not a constant, so if it's not constant, then this means that these two things are linearly independent. So if this was equal to just 2, Okay, we'd have a problem because one is just a scalar multiple of the other. But in this case, one's not a scalar multiple of the other, so they are in fact linearly independent. So since e to the x is not a constant, then y1 and y2 are linearly independent, or linear indent. Okay, so now we verify that they're solutions, we verify that they're linearly independent. Our general solution is just all possible linear combinations of these two. We found our fundamental, or found a fundamental solution set. So our general solution is y is equal to, again, some c1 times y1 plus some c2 y2 
So C1 times uh, Y1, this is E to the X, plus C2 times E 2X. And there we go, we're done at that point in time. So the last stage is here. It's asking me um, to find a unique solution. So the general solution is, again, all possible solutions because it's all combinations of the two. Now we're asking for a particular solution. So we're asking for a specific C1 and C2 in this case. So we need the initial conditions. And again, when we're given initial conditions, we're given uh, information about the point our line has to go through, or our function has to go through. So at y is equal to zero, or sorry, when x is equal to zero in y, it has to go through the point negative two. So zero, negative two has to, has to be included on this. Um, also, at x is equal to zero, the slope of our solution has to be, in this case, three. So we're given information on the original point, the original function, and we're given it on its first derivative. So using this information, again, we're just going to plug and play, and we're going to try and solve from here. So using the first bit of information, again, we're dealing with just... Um, y of 0 is equal to negative 2, I'm going to substitute into my general solution, get just my general because I'm dealing with y in itself, I'm going to plug in 0, and then I'm going to set that equal to negative 2, and I'm going to hopefully find some relationship between c1 and c2. So plugging this in, y of 0 is equal to c1, e to the 0 plus c2 e to the 2 times 0. And again, this has to equal to negative 2. So both of these give me e to the 0, so they're both going to be 1. So this leaves me with c1 plus c2 is equal to negative 2. Okay, so that's, that's not very much fun because now I have one equation in two unknowns. So my unknowns are c1 and c2. I'm not going to be able to solve this. Well, now, this is where I use my information from my y prime to get, again, another relationship between my c1 and c2. And basically what I'm doing is I'm building a system of linear equations that I'm going to be able to, to solve for. So now the first thing I need to do, because what I don't have at this point in time, I have my general solution, but I want the first derivative of this general solution. So we need to find y prime based upon what we have there. So y prime, so I can derive this term by term. I'm doing this with respect to x. So c1 is just some constant I'm taking derivative of e to the x. So this is still c1 e to the x. Plus c2, that's a constant I don't really care. I'm taking the derivative of e to the 2x. So this is just 2e to the x. or 2 c1, sorry, sorry, c2 e to the 2x. Okay, so I found my first derivative of this. Now I'm simply going to substitute in when x is equal to 0 and set that equal to 3. So y prime of 0 is going to be c1 e to the 0. So that's just going to be 1. That's going to disappear to us. Plus 2c2 e to the 2 times 0, so that's still e to the 0, which is still going to be 1. So that's going to disappear, and this is equal to 3. So I have my second equation, again, in two unknowns, the same unknowns as before, c1 and c2. Now I can go ahead and I can use all the properties learned in linear algebra, or just knowing simple elimination from high school, uh, and we're able to solve for what our parameters of C1 and C2 are going to be. So going through this, and I'll let you verify this on your own, um, working this out, this gives me a C1 is equal to negative 7, and a C2 is equal to 5. So again, I'm just solving this as two systems, or as a system of linear equations. I have my C1 and my C2 are my variables, so I have my two equations solved from there. Wait, I have a question. Yeah, shoot. Sorry? 
Okay, yeah. Is that literally independent or is it independent? Literally independent. Okay. So, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah, we'll get to that note. But that note is for something different. So if you look at the two possible uh, e to the, the something x's in there, they're not exactly the same as what we're dealing with here. So my first one is e to the x, and the other one is e to the 2x. There I have them as slightly different. Um, so where was going? Okay, so I have my general solution. I found, given a, an initial condition, a particular solution. So my final answer, my y, for this particular one, C1 is equal to negative 7, so negative 7, E uh, to the X plus 5, that's my C2, E to the 2X. And that is now my final answer. So if this was just a, um, a non-initial value problem, and it just asked me to find the general solution, I would have been done originally where I found, well, my general solutions would have been right here. But since I was looking for a particular solution, I had to find what my C1 and C2 were, and how I always do that is, again, using those initial values. So I have to know something about x for my original function and for its derivative. Now, as for the note here, so here's the e to the x we already determined was a solution. And one of the other things that we've also determined last class, and again, this also relates back to linear algebra dealing with homogeneous equations, is that any constant multiple of that is also going to be a solution. So e to the x and 2 e to the x are both solutions. But these two, again, we're not dealing with these two because we're dealing with two other ones. We have e to the x and e 2 to the x. So a slight variation, these are both solutions, but they're not linearly independent. So they don't form a fundamental solution set, so they're not part of the, the general solution overall, because everything we already know about the solutions, including e to the x, well, 2 e to the x is involved into that one, so it's not giving us any additional information. So the whole idea is I need two unique solutions, or independent solutions, linearly independent solutions, that provide unique information in both, and then all possible combinations of those would generate a, our, our general solution. So do keep that in mind, that again, that step from A to B is important, that I'm just not assuming that those two big solutions, in fact, are our general solution. We need them to be linearly independent. So that's what that note is indicating for. Okay, so... Yeah, the problem with this strategy, as I keep saying, is it depends on the fact that we have to have two linearly independent solutions. So what happens if we have one linearly independent solution? Can we brute force out a, a second one? And the answer to that is yes, but it's not fun. So we're going to go through that process now. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of cheat a bit. So this process is called the reduction of order, which is going to help us cheat and actually be able to solve one of these things. And the name is basically telling us exactly what we're going to do. We're going to come up with a problem. It's going to be a little bit harder for us to solve. We're going to do a substitution and take it down a degree. So again, reduction in order, and then use that to be able to solve the original problem. So I'm going to go through the steps here in order for us to do this. Um, I like going through the steps here because I think not going through them and kind of just giving you the equation going, here it is. Trust me, that's magically works. It's kind of cheating you out on this whole idea. So I'm going to walk through this step by step, but don't really be too concerned if there's some small part that doesn't make 100% right now. We want the final equation at the end. I just want to show you how we come up with this. So again, the reduction of order is a technique to find a second solution, but again, it all depends on the fact that we have a first solution to begin with. If we don't have a first solution, this doesn't matter to us. So again, if y1 and y2 are linearly independent, and we look at the, the ratio between the two of them, exactly as I had done up here with e to the x and e2 to the x, if it spits out something constant, then that's a the problem. They're not linearly independent, they're dependent. They're a constant multiple of the other. So let's make the assumption now that they're not. 
that they're not dependent. So it's not a constant. So it's going to be some function of x. We're going to call that u of x. I don't know what that is. Our goal is to try and find some function u of x. When I can, I can rearrange this and say my y2, my second solution, is going to be a product of my first solution times this magical u to the x function, or u of x function right now. So that, that's our goal. We want to find some function here, some u to the x, that the product of this two gives us a second linearly independent solution. So here's the fun part. So again, we start off by assuming, because again, if we don't make this original assumption, um, we're assuming that y2 is in fact linearly independent. So again, we're assuming that this u to the x does in fact exist, and again, that we do have some y1. So if this is in fact true, if y2 in this form is a solution, then same as what we did up here, I should be able to derive it twice. I should be able to plug it into my left-hand side, and it should spit out my right-hand side. So let's begin with that process. Let's test this. Even though, again, we don't know what u to the x is right now. You say u to the x, not u to the x, it's u of x. Sorry. So what I'm going to do now, just because I keep screwing up the, the x part of this, I'm just going to remove the x and call it u and call y1, not y1, uh, of x. Okay, so that's my original function. Again, I don't know what u is. But well, we're going to try and solve this. So if I take the first derivative of this, y is a function of x, u is a function of x. So what I have here is a product. So I need to use the product rule. So again, take the, D, uh, the original, the, keep the first. So I'm going to keep the u, take the derivative of the second, then take the second times the derivative of the first. So that's our basic product rule there. Again, I don't know what any of these things are. Well, I know what y1 is, or I will know what y1 is, but I don't know what u, and I definitely don't know what u prime is going to be yet. And I repeat this process, and I have my second derivative. Again, I'm going to have a number of different product rules inside of here, I'm going to be able to simplify things. You can verify on your own that this is in fact true, but again, it's just product rules. Um, u is a function of x and y is a function of x. Okay, so now what I do, I have my second solution, or my second possible solution. I've taken the first and second derivative. Let's plug it into the left-hand side of my equation. So the left-hand side of my equation in standard form is as follows. So I have y double prime is equal to some continuous function p times y prime plus some continuous function q uh, y. So that's my left-hand side. Again, this is equal to zero, but I don't care about that part just yet. Well, I will care about that in just a second. But for now, again, and we're keeping this very, very vague because it's not caring about what P and Q are at this point in time. This is just, if we have something in this form, this will work for us. So if I plug everything in, I get this nasty mess here. So all I've done is I've taken my second derivative, I've included it in the first term, my function p times my uh, first derivative, and then plus just y in itself, or y times uh, q. Now what I want to do is I want to rearrange all of this, because remember, our end goal is I'm trying to solve for some u. I want to find that original function u of x. So let's arrange all of this. I'm going to expand, collect my like terms, but I'm looking for now things to be in terms of u, u prime and u double prime. So if I reorganize this, this is what I end up with. So I have u times something that might look familiar here. So I have y1 uh, double prime plus, plus p y1 prime plus q y1. Think about that one for a second. And then I have everything else here. So I have my second term, u double prime y1, and then u prime and some smattering of other stuff up there. But let's focus on this first little bit here. If I removed the y1 and just wrote that as y, what, the, what would that look like? I'm going to go two lines up. Would this not, where's my little mouse thing here? There we go. Would this not, again, if I removed, instead of calling this y, one double prime, I just call this y double prime. Well, this looks like y double prime. P, y instead of one, just P, y prime, exactly what I have here. And again, Q, y, exactly what I would have here. So all I'm doing is substituting in, instead of y, I'm substituting in y one. 
But here's the thing, I'm already assuming that Y1 is in fact a solution. So if I were to plug this in, this is my left hand side, that should give me my right hand side and my right hand side is zero. So this part here, this first term, this is going to disappear on us because Y1 is already a solution. So using that information, if we plug that in, I have U times all of that, which is just going to be equal to zero. So that disappears. Now what I have left is this smattering mess over here dealing with my U prime and U double prime. And I know, because again, everything on my left hand side has to equal my right hand side, my right hand side is zero. If this is zero and over here is zero, then this here has to also be zero. So that's the condition that I'm going to have. So now what I want to do is I want to deal with the second and third term here and try and figure out something again in terms of u. Like I said, in all generality, this is really not a fun way of being able to do it, but you're going to see that it's going to work in the end. So again, our focus now is just on that second and third term from the last page over. Now where we're going to do is we're going to cheat a little bit and we're going to do that reduction of order. Because I don't want u double prime and I don't want u prime. So let's change the variables just for now. We're not going to bring it back afterwards, but just for now we're going to change them. So instead of uh, u prime, I'm just going to call that w. And so u double prime will just be u double prime will just be w prime. So if I do this substitution in, well now what do I have? I have something that looks a little bit linear, also potentially might be, well, again, it's, it's first order, so I have all of the techniques, does it fall under? Is it gonna be separable? Is it going to be linear? Can I solve it from here? Can I solve for some W, and then kind of take into the fact that I've done a substitution, resubstitute it back in, and then find the correct U. Because again, really stated that U is what I'm looking to find here. But I have set this up in a nice way, and this is actually going to be a separable function. So what I can do is I can take this second term here, this 2y1 prime plus py1 w, I can move it to the other side, I can isolate for my w's, I can have my w's on one side, my y's on the other side, I can clean this up nice and neat, and then I can integrate both sides. So this is gonna work out to being separable. I'm gonna focus with y on one side and focus with w on the other side. So if I do this, and again, wave my hands that this is actually in fact true, what I'm gonna end up with, or in the end of this, once I kind of rearrange things, and I haven't necessarily set it up in this way, so technically when I would be doing this, I should have had the, uh, the two y1 prime over y to the other side, so let's just think it's over there for now. But again, if I'm integrating both sides, dealing with one with respect to y, one with respect to uh, w, then what I'm going to end up with here is, whoop, I'm integrating both sides, I end up with the following mess. Ah, oh, it's not really a mess. It looks a little bit nicer than what I was playing around with before. So I now have ln of w plus ln of y1 squared, and again, it's just playing around with what I have here, is equal to the negative of that integral of p d to the x. So I still need to figure out what that is, but I can't figure that out yet because, again, I'm keeping this very general. I don't know what this function p is. But I know it's continuous, so I should be able to integrate it. And I'm, I'm just putting that constant of integration there, so when I solve for this integral of p dx, I don't need to include another constant. That c1 is just going to be my constant from here. Okay, so now what I want to do, again, I've done the substitution for u. Which again, remembering, again, this is where things get a little bit complicated, so we want to keep in mind what we're dealing with. I, I want to solve for u, but I've changed u to w to do this reduction of order. So now I want to solve for w, and I want to work my way backwards. So I want to isolate for w. Right now I have ln w, so that's a problem. So if I take e to both sides, I can get w times y1 squared is equal to, and again, I can tidy things up on my right-hand side, and if I tidy things up, I'm going to have some constant, again, I'm calling that c1, times e to the exponent negative integral p dx. Like I said, this is not a very fun way of getting there. We're still not even at the, the formula for this part of time yet. 
Okay, so I want to, at least at this point in time, solve for W. Why one is a solution? It's a non-trivial solution, which meaning it's not going to be the zero solution. Otherwise, none of this would be making any sense. So if it's non-zero, I can divide out by it. If I divide out by it, I now have W is equal to C1 e to the negative integral P dx all over Y1 squared. Okay, so we have W. We've done the reduction of order. I figured out what W is. Now I can bring it back up to the right order, which is doing the original substitution. Instead of W, now I want to bring it back to U prime. So I'm just going to call this U prime now. I'm substituting back in. Okay, but we're not solving for U prime. We're solving for U. So this is it. This is the very last step. To get rid of U prime, I'm going to have to integrate, and I'm integrating that mess on the right-hand side. Yeah, there's a question. Um, so this one here, uh, it's C1 times E. So it's just going to be some constant. So uh, if I went from, here we go, let's take two seconds here. Um, oh, my chalk's over here, perfect. So if I went from the line uh, ln of y, or sorry, ln of absolute w plus ln absolute value of y1 squared is equal to um, negative integral p dx plus some c1. Well, one thing I can do at this point in time, I can combine my lawns here. So using my properties of lawns, if I have a summation in here, it's a product of what the arguments are actually are. So this is really ln of the absolute value of w times y1 squared is equal to negative integral p dx plus c1. Now I want to be able to free up just my w, so I take e to both sides. Taking e to both sides eliminates my ln. So this is gone, and I'm left with W, Y1 squared. Well, technically I'm left with absolute value of W, Y1 squared. So we'll leave it in absolute value just for now. Then on this side, I have E to the negative integral P dx. And again, using properties of now exponents, I have, I have addition inside my exponents. I can treat that as multiplication by the same base. So this is just E to some c1, which in this case, this is going to be some constant. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to get rid of that absolute value. So I'm going to have w y1 squared, oops, get rid of the absolute value, is equal to plus or minus c, uh, or e, c1, e to the negative integral pd uh, dx. And now I'm going to treat this because e to sub c1 is going to be some constant, plus or minus is still going to be some constant, so I'm going to call this wy1 squared is equal to, I'm calling it here still c1, I should probably have called it something else, I should have called this c e negative integral p dx. So that's where I end up with that from. All right, so now I have u prime, awesome, that's where I want to be, almost, I want to actually have u. So to solve for u, I already have something here, I have some rational, wow, I have some mess, that's for sure. It already has one integral in it, so I need to be able to integrate p dx. Once I can do that, well, I have some e to that, but then in order to find u, I have to be able to integrate again. So now I have a general solution. So if I have one, it doesn't have to be linearly independent because again, that doesn't make any sense when I only have one thing. If I have one solution that is non-zero, I can find a second solution by first finding this. Well, almost this. Because this is the general solution, I want a particular solution. So let's pick a value of C1 and C2. I want them to be as easy as possible. So I'm going to let my C1 be 1. I'm going to let my C2 be 0. So here's my particular solution. So if I can find this, then I can find a second function. 
So this is my reduction of order. So given one, I could use this method. So I'm not saying memorize this method because this is going to be nuts to try and memorize. I would stick with memorizing the formula here. And this is pretty much really the only formula that I would really recommend memorizing in this course. But this is a good one to memorize. So this finds me my function u. So now I can find a second function. I can find a y2 by taking this u of x times y1. Then I will have two linearly independent solutions. And again, it is going to be linearly independent because u of x here, this is not going to be some constant. This is going to be this nightmare here. But again, if we follow this, this is going to allow us to find that second linearly independent solution and go from there. So worst case scenario, this is what we can do. Now there's easier ways, and we'll see in just a second here, easier way, get out of your fly. I don't know what's attracting flies up here. This is weird. Um, and now I just lost my train of thought. Right. So uh, we are going to be looking at specific cases of where, you know, we're not going to be dealing with some nasty P functions and Q functions. We're going to be dealing with some nice numbers in there, and we're going to have an easier way of being able to find our solutions. But for now, this is going to work in all generality. So our particular solution, so Y2, again, is equal to this. Or really this mess. So let's work through at least one example of this because why not? Yeah. Uh, why do we assume that C1 and C2 are 1 and 0 respectively? Um, well, we can put them to whatever we want. Like this is all possible solutions. We just want one solution. So I'm going to pick the easiest out of all solutions. So I don't want some scalar in there other than 1. And for C2, I don't want to add some additional constant on there. So I'm going to pick that to be 0. All right, so let's go through a relatively painless, hopefully painless example of this one. Um, and then we're going to move on to easier cases of this. So we're going to be dealing with specific functions for our P and our Q. Well, not really specific functions, but yeah, they're going to be constants. So instead of functions of X, they're just going to be constants. And we're going to use, again, the, the general look and feel of these equations to kind of brute force out what the, the two solutions should be. All right, so let's go through exercise four. Um, here we go. Okay, so for this one here, I am already given one solution. It's not asking you to verify it, but we'll take the, the word for it that this is in fact one solution. So I'm saying y1 is equal to x squared. And this is a solution to x squared y double prime uh, minus 3x y prime plus 4y is equal to 0. Um, and we want to find the general solution of the differential equation on this given interval. So our interval is going to be um, from 0 all the way up to positive infinity, but again, not including 0 in itself. Uh, that's going to help because right now I do have a, a problem, at least with starting off all of this. What might the problem be with this equation? I typically always want to have it in a specific form. Yeah. Uh, y prime is not by itself. It has the x squared function in front of it. Yeah, so I want this in standard form. So in standard form, to get rid of that x squared, I want to divide out everything by x squared, which is great because I've already guaranteed that this is over the interval of 0 to positive infinity, but not including 0 uh, and obviously positive infinity. So 0 is not going to be an issue here. So I can definitely divide out by x squared. So our first step is we want to we want to put this into standard form. So if I put this into standard form, I'm just dividing by my uh, left and right hand side by x squared. So this is going to leave me y double prime minus 3 over x uh, y prime plus 4 over x squared uh, y is equal to 0. Okay. So now this is in standard form. So what I want to do is I want to grab the important bits of information, and I'm going to take a step back here, go to the, the slide previous again, because I just want to keep U up here. So what do I need to be able to find this, this U? 
Well, first I have to identify what my function p is and I have to be able to integrate it. That's gonna be my exponent of e and kind of simplify everything down from there. So let's do that. So p is simply just my function in my second term or the function with my y prime. So p of x is just negative three over x. So I've got that in terms of my second solution, again, y1 is equal to x squared. So I've got all the basic information now, having this in standard form, all I want to do is really find out what this function u is. So I'm going to try and plug and play and solve from there. So if I'm working this out, we now look to find u. So again, u of x, this is equal to the integral of e to the exponent negative integral p of x, d of x, all over y1 squared and dx. So I plug and play, try and simplify down again as much as I can. So I have the integral of e to the negative integral, well, p of x, I have, right here, that's negative three over uh, x. Well, that negative and three, I can just rip out, so I don't really need this negative here. I can take that negative out, and I can take that, that three out, so this is really three, integral one over x dx. Okay, well, that's not bad, and we can easily integrate that. All over, uh, y1 squared, y1 squared, well, that's just x squared squared, or x to the 4. All right, so let's keep working this out. Okay, so this is just going to be the integral of e to 3. Now, the integral of 1 over x we know that to be ln of the absolute value of x. But again, I don't care about the absolute value part. Why don't I care about that? Yeah. The integral is zero to I'm only dealing with positive values of x anyway, so I don't need to include that absolute value. So this is really just ln, um, that's a ln of x, um, all over x to the fourth. Oh, dx. Great. Right. I'm going to make one substitution here. Well, not substitution. I'm going to use my properties of log. So remember, if I have a multiple on the outside, that's um, an exponent of my argument on the inside. So I can erase this 3 here. Well, actually, let's not just erase it. So I'm not going to be that person. So this is the integral of now e to the log of x cubed all over x4 dx. So again, properties of law, I'm taking this 3 and I'm moving this in as my exponent. Now I have my cancellation law and e inverses of one another, so I'm left with x cubed. So I have x cubed over x to the 4, or this is really just the integral now of 1 over x dx. Well, that was nice. I might have planned this very nicely to have something that's going to work out like this. It's not always going to work out like this. Um, and I can tell you, if you end up with a question of reduction of order anywhere, uh, I'm going to make sure it's going to be something that's going to work out like this, because, yeah, a lot of times it's, we're going to have to use software to be able to approximate this thing. It's not going to be nice. So this, again, integral of 1 over x. Again, ln of the absolute value of x, but I don't care because of the absolute value. It's not in my range. I only have positive x. So this is ln of x. So I found my u. Not too bad, again, for very carefully crafted examples, but I found my u. I have my first solution. I found a non-constant u. This means I automatically know what my y2 has to be. So my y2, I'll leave this up here. My y2, again, is just going to be this here, my ln x times my y1, which is going to be my x squared. Actually, I should put this on the 
other side, so it'll look a little bit nicer. This will be x squared lot of x. And those two things are definitely linearly independent. Because if I have y2 over y1, this leaves me with ln of x, which again is exactly what I found over here for you. So I have two linearly independent solutions. That was the whole point of this reduction of order, to force this to be, this specific u to be a solution. It is. So two linearly independent solutions. It's asking me for the general solution. So this is just going to be, let's put them together, all possible combinations of them. So this is my y is equal to c1, my first uh, solution, so x squared, plus c2, my second solution, x squared, mod of x. And there we go. That is my general solution. My problem is solved. So as I said for this one, it's not all that fun if I don't have really nice functions to begin with. So if my function p, get what's in my second term there, is already a nightmare to try and integrate, I might end up with something nice, I might not end up with something nice, but then I have to integrate it all again afterwards. Uh, it works. Again, we can brute force a second solution, but it's not fun. So now, let's go to some more fun things. Well, more fun than this. We're going to look at special cases now where we can actually figure out what solutions are going to be without having to go through this kind of, kind of nightmare. But again, in all generality, when I have things in standard form for homogeneous equations, for any continuous function p, q, I can always brute force a second solution. All right, how many people are still having fun? Okay. All right, so this case, we're now dealing with constant coefficients. Coefficients, there we go. Um, so if I have an A, B, and C, typically beforehand in all generality, these were just some functions of X, these are just gonna be some constants. And more in particular, obviously A can't be zero because then this wouldn't be a second degree problem, this would be a first. So A, B, and C are constants, A not equal to zero. Whoops, jumped way too ahead on that one. Can I not go back? There we go. I don't know why I would jump back and forth. Okay, there we go. Well, I kind of just gave away the answer, but let's pretend you didn't see that part. So I want to be able to find a solution to this, this problem. So again, I have, I'm looking for some y that I can be able to derive twice and plug in here. And again, my left-hand side is equal to my right-hand side. So if I'm looking at the general look and feel of this, I'm looking for some function that again, when I mull, or when I take the first derivative, it's just a constant. A constant of the first, or of the original function itself. And when I take the second derivative, again, I want it to be some constant of the original function. So I want to find something that when I derive it, it gives me itself back with possibly a multiple of that self. So I can kind of try and work through some of the basic functions I have, but I know if I have a polynomial of say degree three, if I take the derivative of it, I'm now down to at most a degree two. So that's not going to work. My sine and cos, okay, those are, those are good, but they're, they're not giving me back the original. They're gonna jump in between each other. That might be useful at another point in time, but again, not for this. Because again, the look and feel, I want that left-hand side to cancel to be equal to zero. So I really need it. That be, again, when I take that first and second derivative, I want it to give me my original function back, just some multiple of that. Lo and behold, again, I just had this slide up there, so let's pretend we saw this for the first time. Yay, e to the x does this. Well, almost e to the x. Because again, I want it to be some constant multiple. So I'm going to say this is some e to r of x. Because if I take the derivative of this, that r is going to come down, it's going to be r e to the x. So this is a function that looks like it could fit this sort of pattern that if I pick the correct R, I could plug and play, and this should actually work as a solution. So that's the, the kind of the game plan at this point. Now let's try and pick a, a specific R. But we're gonna need more than one R, because this is gonna give us one solution. So let's see how we could possibly work this out. So again with this one, 
I'm just showing here that if I take the derivative, first and second derivative, all I'm dealing with, r is just some constant, r squared is still some constant, and it's a constant of the original function. So it looks like I can actually do this. So it's not a, um, a direct solution to any of these problems. It's again, we're looking at how this function behaves, how the first and second derivative behaves, and we're like, well, maybe we can put something in here. Maybe this is going to work. But now we need to find that, that r value. All right, so this is what's known as, again, when we're dealing with the constant coefficient case. So if we substitute this into our equation, so again, I take its first derivative, I take the second derivative, I plug it into the left-hand side, this is exactly what I get. So all I've done here is simply replace my y, y prime, y double prime, with exactly those derivatives that I had before. So my y being e r to the x, my y prime being r e r to the x, and my y double prime being r squared e r to the x. So we plug them in here. Doesn't look that much nicer. But let's try and simplify this up. So one of the nice properties that we have with e to really the anything is it's never going to be zero. And if that's never going to be zero, I can divide both sides by e r to the x. So let's do that. Let's try and simplify this as much as possible. And what we end up with is now, again, e r to the x is gone. Now I have an a r squared plus b r plus c is equal to zero. Well, that's just a quadratic in variable r. I can solve this either by factoring or the quadratic equation. So what this is telling me, if this original amount, because again, we're assuming this e r to the x is a solution. If this is a solution, then what has to be true? Well, this a r squared plus b r plus c has to equal to zero. So we have to be able to find some r that I can plug in that gives me a zero. And if I can do that, awesome. Well, we know we definitely can do that, because again, we have that quadratic equation. And we should know that there's three possible outcomes. Or hopefully we know that there's three possible outcomes here. One of them is going to be a complex option. We'll get to that in just a second. So again, we say a solution exists only, or if and only if, we can find an R such that this holds true. And again, we can find an R such that this in fact holds true. So this equation is known as your auxiliary, uh, auxiliary equation, or just your characteristic equation, no different than we were dealing with back in uh, linear algebra, dealing with determinants, uh, trying to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, all that fun stuff I know so long ago. So again, we have two solutions. I have two possible R's. Well, sometimes I do. Sometimes I can have an R1 and R2. Now I say sometimes because, again, remember the quadratic equation that negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Well, I, that plus and minus only really counts if what I have is, again, under that square root. If I have something that's positive, if I have something that's negative, if it's negative, that's okay. We're going to deal with complex. But if it's positive, again, awesome. We're going to have two different roots. But if it's zero, well, then that plus and minus disappears, and I just have one root. But that's okay, too, because we just actually had a method, again, not a fun method, but we did, in fact, have a method of being able to brute force a second independent solution as long as we have one. So in this case, it looks like it's going to really be broken down into three specific cases. If what I have under that square root is going to be greater than zero, I'm going to have two unique real roots, which is going to get me, again, two unique linearly independent solutions. Awesome. If it's zero... I'm going to have one root. That's okay. I just need a solution. As soon as I have a solution, I can do that reduction of order. There's going to be an easier way. Don't worry. We'll get to that in just a second. But we're going to be able to figure out that second one. And last case is when it's complex. Again, we're going to have two complex, and we're going to be able to solve from there. So in this case, it's always going to work for us. So let's go over the first case. Distinct real roots. So R1 and R2 are two real unequal, so again, what's under that square root is greater than zero, uh, to the auxiliary equation, then we have the following. Then our general solution is of this form. So our general solution to again, and I do want to note here that I'm not starting with this in standard form. That's perfectly fine. I don't need to start with this in standard form. We, we keep it as is for now. So 
Again, if I have this, and I have a positive under that, positive greater than zero under that square root, then my general solution is going to be C1, so some constant E, to the first root, X, plus some constant C2, again, times E to R2, that second root, times X. So let's go through an example here. All right, so exercise five, we want to find the general solution to this differential equation. So right away I've noticed, hey, it's in standard form, awesome. It doesn't necessarily need to be in standard form, but it is in standard form. I don't have a solution for it off the, the top of my head, so it's not like I can do a quick reduction of order to figure out a second solution. So now I move on to my, my other cases going, okay, I look at my, my functions of x in front of my y's and notice that they're all constants. Cool. So now this looks like our constant terms, so we use this e r to the x as a possible solution. So we're going to make a first assumption here, and I'm going to state my assumption even though I don't really need to, but again, for the sake of completeness, might as well. There we go, more shot. Uh, exercise five. Okay, so our first assumption is we're going to assume y is equal to e r to the x is a solution. Now, if it is a solution from the slides previous, and again, I can work this all out. I can take the first derivative of this, second derivative of this, plug it all in, isolate for everything that I want, or I could simply jump to my characteristic or auxiliary equation from here. If this is true, then, again, all I'm looking at now is my coefficients. So I see for my double prime, it's one, for my prime, it's negative one, and for my y, it's negative six. So all I'm doing at this point in time is I'm just removing the y double prime, and I'm putting that as r squared. y prime, that's just gonna be r, and y is just going to be nothing. That's my constant. So if I do that, then r squared minus um, r minus 6 has to be equal to 0. That's from the slide before. That's what we've already shown. Is that again, if this is true, I take the first and second derivative. I do my substitutions. I divide out by e to r to the x, and I get exactly this in the end. So you're welcome to go through that steps if you want but I'm comfortable with you going from here to here. So if this is a solution, then this has to be true. So now all we need to do is just find what are those specific R values. So if I can see how to factor this, awesome, I'm just gonna go to that. If I can't see how to factor this, then I use that quadratic equation, whatever you're comfortable with. So we have this, this is not horrible to factor, this is gonna be R minus three, R plus three, oh, R plus two, not three, there we go, is equal to zero. Right, there we go, that works out. Um, so this tells me that the only way this is going to be zero is again, one of the other is zero, so r is going to be, well in this case, if r is negative two, then this gives me a zero, and if r is positive three, this gives me a zero. So I have two different r's, both real numbers, thus I have two unique real solutions. So based upon this assumption, working all of this out, and C isn't this so much easier than what we just did beforehand. So much easier with our constants. This now tells me that my first solution, y1, is equal to um, e to the negative 2x. My second solution, y2, is e to the 3x. And again, if I look at the ratio between the two, it's not going to be some constant. They are linearly independent. So this means my general solution, y is equal to c1, y1, plus c2, y2. Or c1, y1, e to the negative 2x, plus c2, e to the 3x. And again, that's it. That is our, our general solution. So constant coefficients, so much easier. 
than what we've had to deal with beforehand. Um, two questions. Yeah. How do you know which one goes with which? So C1 is with negative 2x there. Is this right? It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Whatever order you want to put them in, because again, it's all possible linear combinations. C1, C2, completely arbitrary. So whatever order you want to put them in, dealer's choice. Both are going to be right. Typically, we put the more negative to the left than to the right, so going in increasing order, but who cares? Oh, someone probably cares. I don't. Works out the same. Uh, yeah? Um, can you please go over again uh, how you, um, you said that the R squared minus R minus 6 equals 0? And you said we can go really like straight to that, but where, how do we uh, find that? Yeah, so this is just from the, the slide beforehand. So if I'm assuming this is a solution, so again, that's, that's the assumption. We assume that it's a solution. So what needs to be true is that y e r to the x, y prime uh, r e r to the x, y double prime r squared e r to the x. If I were to substitute this in, my left-hand side is going to equal my, my right-hand side. So if I did exactly that, um, so y double prime, this is r squared e r to the x. I'm going to have a minus y prime, so that's r e r to the x um, minus 6y, which is e r to the x, is equal to 0. Now we know, again, e r to the x is always going to be positive, so I divide both sides by it. So this disappears, this disappears, this disappears, and I'm left with r squared is e minus r minus 6 is equal to 0, which, again, I just get from looking at my coefficients and substituting out. Um, instead, if I see y, I'm going to see uh, nothing. If I see y prime, it's going to be r. And if I see y double prime, that's going to be r squared. Thank so you. you could go right to there, but I'm more than happy of you to, to jump down to this point in time. Yeah? And the, uh, the erx always being positive, that's the thing that he does. That's just one of the characteristics of you, right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's look at the case number two. Case number two is when, again, I'm looking under that square root, we'll leave the, uh, the complex for the very end there. Uh, when we're looking under that square root and we get a zero, so that, again, the quadratic equation, that negative b plus or minus, now I have zero. So that plus and minus doesn't count, so now I just have negative b over 2a. So I have one solution, I need to find a second solution. Well, I'm gonna tell you now, the second solution and how we can do this, again, using the reduction of order, if we really want to go through all this, which I think I do in my next slide. Um, I might skip over that part, or actually I might just show you that it is, in fact, a solution. Um, if I have my first solution, which is going to be y1 er to the x, so that only root that I have, my second solution, my y2, is going to be er to the x, so exactly what I have before, but now I'm going to toss in an x as well. So it's x er to the x. So when I uh, do a ratio of the two, I'm left with just x. So again, not constant, means linearly independent. So the only thing I haven't shown is that if this is true, if er to the x is a solution, then x er to the x is also a solution. So we should show that. So let's work through that one, and I'm not gonna do the, we can come up with this x er to the x through reduction of order, but we're not gonna do that. I'm just gonna show you that this is in fact a second solution. So assuming that it is, in fact, a second solution, so again, what should I be able to do? I should be able to take itself, its first derivative, its second derivative, and x, er to the x, I'm going to have a product rule through all of these things. I'm going to isolate for everything, make it all look nice and pretty. Then I'm going to take my original function, that's my left-hand side right there, my a, y2 double prime plus b, y2 prime plus c, y2, and again, just substitute in those ones. Okay, now I have a little bit of a mess. But let's tidy this up. Let's make this look a little bit nicer here. So now what I want to do is I want to group things in terms of e r to the x and in terms of x e r to the x. So if I do exactly that, okay, now my first term is I have something times e r to the x. My second term is something times x e r to the x. If I specifically look at the second so my second term here, this ar squared plus br plus c, that's exactly what we are doing down here. That is my auxiliary equation. 
So I'm already assuming that this R in fact exists and this is true, it's the correct R. So that second term is just going to be, that coefficient is going to be zero. Because again, that's our auxiliary equation, that specific R that we're plugging in gives us zero. Now the first term, I'm also stating here that 2AR plus B is also going to give us zero. Okay, that might not be as clear. So let's go here. Let's raise this part for a second. So remember what R is. R is equal to uh, negative B plus or minus square root B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. Now in this case, we're dealing with the only one root. So under that square root is going to be a zero. So this part here disappears. So all I'm left with is negative B over 2A. And if I plug that in, so if I look at that left or that first term, so the 2AR uh, plus B, and I substitute in, well, this is my R. This is 2A times negative B over 2A plus B. 2A's disappear, negative B plus B, that goes to zero. So first, side go, or first term goes to zero, second term goes to zero. All we've done here is we plugged in this possible second solution, this X, ER to the X, and it spits out zero for me. Awesome. This tells me I have two solutions. And because I have two solutions and they are linearly independent, this forms a fundamental solution set, so I do have all possible combinations of these. So all I need for this one is to find out what that first root is. So ER to the X is my first solution, my second solution, X. E R to the X. Nice and easy. I don't have to brute force anything. It's always going to work out that way. All right, so let's go through this last example here. Again, fairly straightforward in the sense that we just need to find out what those roots are. Exercise number six. So again, we make that initial assumption. So we're assuming y is equal to er to the x is a solution. If it's a solution, then again, we can jump right away to that characteristic or auxiliary equation. So all I'm doing is, again, I'm starting off with that first term, so y double prime, that's just going to be r squared. Then I have plus 4, y prime is just going to be r, and my constant term, because uh, my y is just going to disappear, I can think of that as r to the 0, um, this is just plus 4 is equal to 0. So this is my auxiliary equation. Now I need to find an r where this works, so what can I do? I can use that characteristic equation. So here my r is equal to negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So negative b, well, again, this is going to represent my a, b, and c. I'm going to have a negative 4 plus or minus the square root b squared. So b is 4. 4 squared is going to give me 16 minus 4 times a, well my a is 1, and uh, c, my c is 4, all over 2a, which is again, 1. So I have underneath my square root, I have 4 times 1 times 4, that's giving me a 16, so 16 minus 16 gives me a 0, square root of 0 is 0. Perfect. So what's under here is gone. So I'm left with negative 4, Plus or minus doesn't matter, divided by 2, minus 2. So that tells me um, yeah. Uh, so this tells me what my solution is going to be. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Perfect. Um, so this tells me my first solution, my y1, oops, y sub 1, this is e um, negative 2x. 
and my y2 is equal to x e to the negative 2x. Perfect. So I have two linearly independent solutions. Again, I can check the ratio between the two just gives me x. So again, non-constant. So my general solution is y is equal to some c1 e negative 2x plus some c2 x e to the negative 2x. So it's really just recognizing the form and plugging and playing from there. Um, so that's going to put us just about at time. So the last case that we're going to be dealing with, before we all back up here, um, the last case we're going to be dealing with is when we have a negative under that square root. So then we're going to be dealing with the complex case. Um, so that's where we're going to pick up next class. Now do keep in mind, you had your tutorial today, so that was kind of some more practice. The next coming tutorial, so next Tuesday, is going to be our first test. As stated in the email, that first test is going to be containing material from chapter one and chapter two. So only dealing with first order differential equations. So those are our three main techniques, our uh, separation, our linear, and our exact. So make sure that you are aware of that, the applications of them. Um, I did post a mock test. So the idea of the mock test is simply, it's not going to be the test, but I want to give you the look and feel of the types of questions and the level of difficulty that you are going to see. Now with those, you'll notice I didn't post solutions to them. Why is that? Simple answer is because everything that you do, and this is what I really want you to do, you can always check to make sure your solution is correct. You can always plug and play it back in. Did you get it correctly? Because that's the whole point. We're looking to find some specific plot that when I plug it back in, my left-hand side is equal to my right-hand side. So everything that you can do, you can in fact verify that you have done these correctly. So I want you to really focus on that more than anything else. Again, this is just meant for extra practice to give you general ideas, but there's so many practice problems that you need to be doing from the, the textbook that I've already been giving you. Those are great practice as well. Um, so that's it. That's all for today. If you have any other questions, please come on up. Um, we'll have a chat. Otherwise, we'll see you back here on, on Tuesday. So until then. Thank <laughs> you.